It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and for my first time in Westminster Hall as well, it was a great pleasure. Um, I'm very pleased to hear from the Minister that we're going to have a new carer strategy. I think that is very much needed. So I would like to focus today on three aspects of what I believe are important to allow carers to have what we call a life beyond caring. And the first of these has been touched on by the member for Stratford and Ermston and the member for Liverpool Wavertree, and that's the aspect of working carers. So I would like to take a slightly more specific approach than they did with regard to the cliff edge factor of earnings that they spoke about and look at the needs of those carers who actually want to work and go down to Job Centre Plus hoping they can find work, but when they get to Job Centre Plus aren't quite getting the help they need for a number of quite specific reasons that were all revealed in an NAO report um, this time last year. If I can just hi highlight those reasons to the Minister. Um, although there are an enormous army of carers, as we've recognised today, in terms of the workload at Job Centre Plus, carers form a very small part of it. And for many Job Centre Plus advisors, they rarely deal with more than one or two carers every month. I think it's very important that Job Centre Plus needs to have specialist advisors to deal with carers who are looking for employment. That, in my view, is vitally important. As the jobs that many carers go to do are inevitably part-time because of their caring duties, they don't go forwards to form part of what Job Centre Plus has to submit to meet their targets in terms of achieving the, um, job, job people in full-time employment. So can I therefore plead with the Minister to make sure that although this is occurring, what it means is that those carers are not seen as a priority by Job Centre Plus because they aren't helping them get to hit the targets that central government wants them to. And that means that they become a marginalised part of the business of Job Centre Plus. And I'm also a bit concerned at what I read in this NAO report, that many Job Centre Plus advisors are not quite certain what it is they are doing. As an example, the NAO report found that two-thirds did not realise that carers who claim only carers allowance do not need to attend work-focused interviews. When you have two-thirds of staff who don't understand quite a crucial part of the needs of a carer, that does worry me. And finally, as an example of perhaps Kafkaesque bureaucracy gone mad, Job Centre Plus advisors are encouraged to hand out carers' allowance application forms, but they are not allowed to help fill them in. Here's a form, but don't ask me any questions, please, because I can't answer them. I'm afraid that, you know, we hear it so often. So I would hope that in the new carer strategy we can try and address some of those quite specific issues so that those who do go down to Job Centre Plus looking for work get the help they need. The second area I would like to focus on is the need for respite care. Um, I welcome what the last government did in recognising that it was good to give carers respite care. I regret the fact that for one reason or another, much of the money, as the Minister pointed out, never quite made it to the front line. And it does show the danger of raising expectations within a group of people that are then not fulfilled. Um, I pay tribute to organisations like Vitalise, a charity that provides space for 7,000 people to have respite breaks each year. They stretch from in Cornwall in the south to Southport in the north, and I regret the fact they can't manage an extra 20 miles to make it to Blackpool and have their breaks there, but maybe I can encourage them to do that a bit more. Who knows? But as their part of Carers Week last, um, this year, they set up what they call their Care to Share Forum which was an opportunity for people who need respite breaks to share experiences of what they had and, indeed, what they didn't get, having expected they might get it from the government's announcements last time. And that, I think, is a very useful thing that Vitalise has done because a lot of it is about people being quite nervous of going abroad or going away or leaving the person they care for. There are a lot of hurdles to having the ambition to go away. And I think the more that we can share information and allow people to feel more confident about um, leaving the people they care just for even 24 hours, the much more easier it will be for respite care to become an established part of the caring agenda. Um, so I would therefore ask, in particular, can the Minister make sure 
that in the NHS operating framework and the NHS vital signs, that carer support is not just an optional extra for PCTs to provide, but something which is critical, either tier one or tier two. Because by, by making it tier three, you are basically giving the PCT permission not to bother about it. And that is unfortunately just one of the ways in which micromanagement from the centre can become an excuse for not providing a service. And I would also ask that when the government, when any government actually, makes new monies available, it only does that announcement when it is confident it can monitor implementation and make sure that the money is spent on what it is supposed to be spent for. Because it is not simply not acceptable to raise the hopes of very vulnerable groups of people who think that they are going to get something and then for it not to actually happen further down the line through no fault of ministers or government or government departments, but just because the layers of bureaucracy absorb the money bit by bit by bit. It simply isn't fair. I'd like to echo what the Honourable Member for Tottenham said about young carers. Um, and she was quite right in particular to identify the needs of that 20% she pointed out, who do not do what I would call the traditional caring, where the relative has a progressive disease associated perhaps with old age. In a constituency like mine, Blackpool North and Cleveland, I should think the figure is higher than 20%. We are a very deprived area. We have many public health needs, and I would have thought that very many of the, care, the younger carers are, are dealing with relatives who have a drug addiction, an alcohol problem, or a mental health problem. Um, at the back end of Carers Week this year, I went to the, the local branch of Frankie and Benny's in Blackpool near the Odeon Cinema because um, the local carer centre, funded by the Princess Royal Trust for Carers, like so many of our carer centres I know are, uh, they have a particular interest in Blackpool in the needs of young carers. And Nigel McMurdo, who runs their project, does a fantastic job at trying to give them treats every now and again. And one of these treats was dinner at Frankie and Benny's. So off I trundled down to just meet them, listen to their stories, understand a bit more about what they had to go through. And uh, Nigel told me one tale, for example, of how um, caring can impact on education. Um, the young man caring for his mother who had a mental health problem, he had a geography exam that day, she wouldn't let him out of the house to go and do the exam. They had a real battle just to get him to school to sit the exam even. And that, of course, demonstrates how actually caring for parents as an act of love can actually also be a bar to educational attainment. It has impacts when you're a young carer on your health, on your education, and on your ability to have a social life. Um, I point out, for example, um, the inadequacy of child and adolescent mental health services. It's a long-standing problem. If mental health services are the Cinderella service of the NHS, CAMS is Cinderella's daughter, as it were, the Cinderella service within the Cinderella service. And I've already raised it with regard to autism with the minister. But more widely, I have grave concerns over the condition of CAMS in this country and how it excludes far too many people who need their help. It is a real problem. Uh, and additionally, in terms of education, bullying has a major impact on the lives of many young carers. Bullying occurs when you are seen to be different. And if you have a caring responsibility, that means you can't hang around outside the school gates after school, or when you might be 15 minutes early, or when you don't always get your homework done on time. That inevitably ends up that bullying then takes place, and young carers do need support for that. And I know that the young carers in Blackpool are trying at the moment to draw up what they're calling their young carers charter. And at the top of their list of demands is that every school should have a nominated teacher who can pay attention to the needs of young carers as a sort of early warning system, because there does need to be that early warning system. I don't think we can place the burden entirely upon GPs, as we always seem to try to do, to act as early warning gatekeepers. Um, there's also the difficulty of identifying our young carers. In Blackpool, we know of about 200, but we are quite certain there are about 600 more out there that we just simply don't know about. We can't find them. They aren't there. It's the unmet need that we, also, that we all often talk about. And how do you reach the hard to reach, the perennial question in public health policy, I do fear. Um, platitudes 
abound in the debate on carers, and I desperately try to avoid platitudes in anything I do, but it's often very difficult in this topic. But I would like to start to see some concrete steps occurring that benefit carers. Um, benefit simplification is just one example. I have lost count of the number of times in my constituency I have tried to explain that in order to get the carer's premium, you must first apply for pension credit, which you know you're not entitled to, in order to then apply for the carer's premium, which is illogical to the people I explain it to and illogical to me. Yet it still seems to go on. Can we please try and change that? When I first became involved in health policy some 10 years ago now, I had my file in my office on, on marked care at that time. It basically focused on the width of doors for wheelchairs in the Care Standards Act. I watched the Honourable Minister many a time in the House of Commons raising issues related to care issues, but Carers Week was seen as sort of a peripheral issue 10 years ago. The fact that we had such a large queue in Port Colours House during Carers Week for the photo opportunities and so on was testament, I thought, to the progress that was being made. I still think we actually have to go one step further. Uh, I may be a new MP, but I'm already a little tired of having photo opportunities while I stand beneath some perspex stand, smile, shake a hand, that is somehow evidence of my commitment to an issue. I would far rather MPs did fewer photo opportunities and more visits, as I know so many of us in this room have done, to our local carer centre to hear just what is going on and speak to real carers and not just have our photos taken. That would be a bit more reality, I think, into this place. Um, it was good that the government last government did recognise that carers had a role to play, and I, I recognise them for that. But I would rather that we now have to try to focus on how we enable carers to live a more ordinary life, a life beyond caring. We need to start to fit provision around the needs of carers. As with too much in public life, we expect people to fit into existing tick boxes on forms, and woe betide you if your circumstances don't enable you to fit neatly into those tick boxes. That simply isn't good enough. We need to build provision around the individual. And I know that will be difficult, but not every carer wants to play bingo. Not every young carer wants to go to the cinema of an evening. We all have individual requirements as carers, and we are all individuals after all. That's what we should remember. So I very much hope that the carer strategy that is being drawn up over the summer will start to see carers not just as a group with a label attached and a set of demands, but as individuals who need to be empowered. So I look forward to seeing what emerges after the summer. Thank you very much.